Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and welcome to this meeting of Rutland's Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, for anyone who wasn't here right at the very start, uh, I've been having terrible connection problems. If uh, BT should let me down again, then John will take over and I'll join by phone, but won't be able to chair the meeting. Um, so I'm not proposing that everyone should introduce themselves. It takes rather a long time. If anyone wishes to speak, could they please raise their virtual hand and we'll try to spot you. And when you speak for the first time, if you could say who you are and who you represent. Uh, the one person I will introduce is Councillor David Wilby, who is joining this board, who is the portfolio holder for children's services. So welcome, David, and a steep learning curve probably today. Thank you very much, Chair, and a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. So, Joe, do we have some apologies? Well, I know we do, but who are they? Yes, um, we've had apologies from um, Melthwaite, but we have Mina Bavsa um, attending, uh, who is here. Um, and we've also re received apologies from Louise Platt, um, but she may be able to join us halfway through, so I'll let you know. And also apologies from Sheila Fletcher and Audrey Danvers. Thank you. Uh, the minutes of the last meeting will have been distributed. Uh, if anyone has any major alterations, substantive they want to make, then scream now. Otherwise, I'll just ask for a show of hands that we approve the minutes. I'm not hearing any screaming. So could we have a show of hands just to approve the minutes of the last meeting? Those of you that are here, please. Yeah. That suffice, Joe. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any interests that they need to declare? Any pecuniary interests? I'm not hearing anything. Do we have any petitions, deputations or questions, Jo? Uh, no, none have been submitted. Thank you. And then matters arising from the last meeting. I, I didn't hear your conversation, John, right at the start. Uh, but Mike or John, are you going to update us on we are with the draft um, JHWS? I'm happy to take that, Mike. Yeah. Um, so in the, the backdrop that we now have of 15 months of um, being engaged with the COVID battle, as all seven have around here uh, in the county and the uh, integration of innovation to, uh, to integrate paper from the government and the drive through ICSs. As a system, we've come to the decision that the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy will be amalgamated or become the place plan because it makes sense to have one document that we're all working towards one vision and we also need to, to take into account I think um, the backdrop that we now have um, of COVID and actually quite a changed landscape that we need to take into account and of course how we've all been working so incredibly well together these all need to be captured in this one document. The timeline, the plan currently is being worked upon with the IDG that's the the integrated delivery group, the members of that group and some subgroups with Health Watch. Also being fed into there is information from the Rutland, the future Rutland conversation. It is envisaged that a, um, a, out, a detailed outline of that plan come to our adult scrutiny at the council so members can um, appropriately scrutinise it before it comes to the next Health and Wellbeing Board in draft form. So that's the timeline. I'm not going to say anything more about it personally because we've got colleagues here um, that are going to be talking about these things soon. And I see Mike's got his hand up, Alan. Yeah, yeah, if you want to touch on it, Mike. Yeah, it was, it's just going to be the, the point that John made at the end there, a little bit cut before the horse because actually it's probably worthwhile just um, doing the agenda items later on because that then will feed yeah. into the... Uh, the timeline and the plan, yep. Yeah, makes sense to me. Okay, the next action point um, regarding communications, 
I think, Janet, will you just go to say a few words on that one? Or several, if you wish. Many. Yes. And engagement, really. Engagement oh, stuff. Right. <laughs> I, was I was thinking you wanted me to talk about telephones or something. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the, well, we've been, we started the data collection in April. We've been interviewing uh, people individually and in groups, and we've been doing it face to face, uh, providing that we can ensure COVID regulations are adhered to. And we've also been taking some telephone interviews as well. I don't know the exact number of people that we've actually engaged with, but it's a lot, a lot from Rutland anyway. We've got a whole host of emerging themes, which I'll just run through very, very quickly, just to give you a flavor. We've got travel and transport, use of technology, care closer to home, which breaks down to, into all sorts of different themes, the community hospital, diagnostics, um, emergency and urgent care, um, outpatients, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've got a section on staying well and having a fulfilling social life. That's a working title. And we've looked at what people are actually doing now for both physical and social activities and what they want to do in the future. Um, we've got a section on information and education because um, people were telling us that they wanted um, more information on how to stay well and more information, which surprised me a bit, really, given the um, RISE team stuff uh, on the web, that they, they wanted more signposting towards activities. Um, we also had in that a, a list of obstacles to the success of, of you know, the obstacles to them taking part in these activities and their suggestions. Um, we've got, um, a section on the referrals to hospitals and the communications between hospitals and GP practices and the different hospitals themselves. And a section on the interface between NHS and private care. And that to me was surprising as well because the boundaries have become a lot more blurred. Um, and I wasn't expecting that. We've got a section about living on the boundaries what people, the problems that people sort of in Stamford and um, Stamford and, and that side of the county experience. But we've also got a se section which surprised me about people who live just over the border in Northamptonshire, but are registered with an Uppingham practice and the problems they encounter. Um, we've got a section on a sort of a public partnership with health and care services what the, the public think about taking responsibility for their own health, the opinions of the organization of um, NHS local and national care and wanting to be informed and involved. And then crucially, and this again was a surprise for me, we actually have quite a lot of data about children's services in the county and some of the limitations, particularly for um, Pair, the parents and children uh, with parents of and their children with learning disabilities. And we've been quite concerned with this and have now arranged a meeting with Leicestershire Partnership Trust because um, there are some glaring um, problems that we've been told about. So uh, that's it in a nutshell, really. <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> and I've summarised it in about two minutes. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's great. Great. Thank you, Janet. Um, I think at some point I saw David's head pop up there at the last item. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. I'm sure at some point we'll be sharing that information. And, uh, and I don't know if you know, David, if you have a direct line of communication, but if not, we'll set one up. No, I don't. I don't know him, but I'm happy. I mean, if you're happy for us to divulge the um, information to him before. Um, I think David should see it. Yeah, we're, we're actually well. It raised when, when you're ready. Yeah, I've got. I've. I'm just. Well, I'm hoping to get the first draft of the report finished within the next day or two. 
and then I have to send it off to the boss. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're not we're not pushing for it half finished and not helpful to David, but as soon as it's helpful to him, so he has a heads up, it'll be. Well, I'm quite happy to just talk through the the, the, the things that are con have concerned us immediately, and we've yeah. actioned immediately. There are several other things that we have actioned. Uh, Particularly, um, sort of, as you know, the uh, primary care access. Yeah. Um, that is sort of a big problem locally. Just trying to think what the others are. Hang on, I'll have a. Uh, the other things that we've actioned are, when I can find it, GP access, cross boundary problems. SALT services, lack of visibility for the public of the development of plans, learning disability services, transport difficulties, and the need for a more local hemodialysis service. We've actually passed on to, you know, passed up because they're quite urgent in our minds. <laughs> Thanks for that, Janet. Uh, item three, a representative from Health Watch would be appointed to the IDG to represent the public voice. Has that happened? Yeah, it's Tracy. Okay. Um, item four, the IDG would drive work forward and would update the board on a broad timeline. So I take it again, that's later in the agenda, is it, John? That's part of what we're talking about. Yes, yes, indeed. So it's a broader um, um, group of presentations today. Then going forward, we can become more specific as the subgroups are feeding into the IDG, Alan, and then that can then feed back to this, um, yeah. this board here. Lovely, thank you. So, getting to the substantive items on the agenda. Uh, item six, our approach to integrating care. So we are going to have a presentation and I think, Joe, you're hosting the slides, are you? Uh, yes, I'll just share my screen now, if that's okay, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Councillor Walters. So my name's Sarah Prima. I'm the Executive Director for Strategy and Planning at the three CCGs in LLR. And um, me, John and Faye, if she's, I can't see her in, in front of me, but I'm sure she's on the call, are going to take the uh, members through the, the next section. I think we, what we've agreed to do is effectively bring the two presentations together. Um, the next two items on the agenda, which is the ICS development and the um, and in, in you know our journey on integration. So, Joe, would you like to share the slides, please? Can you see those now or not? I've got them highlighted on my screen. No, I can't. I can't see them. Okay, <laughs> let's start off with this one. Um, can you see them now? No. No. Ah, something's happening. Uh, yeah, that's sorry. Fine. Let's let's start. No, that's this. fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, so I think I'd start off by saying that um, we're not starting from zero here. Uh, and if, and in fact, in Rutland, you've had such, you have had a really, really good track record of developing integrated care, particularly across social care and and health and with wider partners. So, uh, what I think we want to talk to you about is a continuation of that journey, um, both for what it means for Rutland, but also within the context of the wider national changes that are happening across the NHS and uh, et cetera, around the development of integrated care systems. So next um, slide, Joe, please. So th th we, th th in um, November, 2020 last year, and as a direct result of how COVID had brought people together to work in a much more integrated way across the country and in, in neighborhoods and systems and places, et cetera, um, the government, um, developed a, a, a discussion document, if you like, about what would the next steps be in integrated care. And basically that's resulted in a white paper and legislation going through Parliament currently around the development of formal integrated care systems. But as I said, integrated care systems, I think, is, is a title, but we've been doing that job for quite a while. 
Um, and we wanted to take you through um, some of that today, but also give you a bit of background about what is nationally being said about the next stages. So in terms of the formal integrated care systems, um, what they are about is it is about joining up and coordinating care, particularly across health and care, but also bringing into that arena those wider organisations such as the voluntary and community enterprise sector that support so many people in their local communities. It, it's got a real focus on proactive and preventative care, so a real focus on population health management, preventative agendas, etc. And it needs to be responsive to population needs because we'll go on to a minute to discuss how the, how the infrastructure looks, but it's very much built from neighbourhoods to place and then to systems as opposed to the other way around. There are a few grounding principles, I think, that have set the ICS out. Um, as I've just said, one of them is very much about planning for populations and the population health outcomes, reducing inequalities and all variant of worry variations uh, and that as we all know has been a real highlight during uh, the COVID situation how the pandemic has worsened some of those outcomes for, for, for people across our populations. It's very much building our system of place-based partnerships so those partnerships that are already in place and I think Faye and John will come on to talk a little bit more about how strong the place-based partnerships are in Rutland actually and a real feeling of subsidiarity and local flexibility. So what's right for the local population and flexibility. So the guidance that was issued, there was some guidance issued last week. I had been told that it would be 80% local determination and 20% mandated in terms of how you set up an integrated care system. I think that's followed through in the guidance, which I think is good because it gives us the ability to be flexible and, and to develop, develop um, arrangements that suit our populations and suit our localities. Um, and a real focus on collaboration as well. So particularly collaboration between local authorities and the NHS, but also building on the collaboration between all of us in the public and, um, and also across different sectors of, the, of providers. Um, so fundamentally integrated care systems are there to improve outcomes in the population, to tackle inequalities in outcomes, experience and excess, support all of us in the agenda around social and economic development through um, an approach that we can use our resources of the public sector in a better way known as anchor approach and to enhance our productivity and value for money. So um, it's very much about enabling care, grounded in a, some principles around populations, uh, lo lo locality, uh, localism, and then um, improving outcomes. So can I have the next slide, please, Joan? So I think we, we have talked about what our system is. This isn't new to, to us, so our system across LLR has always been that the integrated care system um, has been at the Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland level, so there were certain things that are right to do there. And then we have three places in LLR, Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. And then in at a neighbourhood level, each of those places have a different construct in terms of their place. And for Rutland, you have one place, which is Rutland. So from a so from a simplicity perspective in terms of how we organize services it it's it is easy to it's easier to do in Brooklyn. so can i have the next slide please so in terms of developing um integrated care systems further what you know these are just a few things that i wanted to touch on that i think are important for Rutland, but also for other areas as we start to develop further it's, it's not a new approach, I, I do want to reiterate that. It is a continuation of what we've been doing around integration of care, improving care outcomes uh, for our populations and our residents. Um, and it is building on what we've done, but working more collaboratively together across providers, but also across local authorities and health, will be, a, a, I'm hoping will help us move um, uh, things faster and quicker but it is really about working together to understand our communities, having a population health management approach. So in terms of individual, not, you know, not just necessarily individual disease, but the whole person, 
and having that approach to how we manage, organise and deliver care. Uh, a continuation of our joining and coordinating of the services across both providers, as I've just said, but also across local authorities and providers, and really understanding how we can work together to address social and economic determinants of health and well-being and reduce those health inequalities that we see in lots of populations across our system. So I think I'm going to hand over to John and Faye just to take you through um, what it's looked like in Brooklyn, what have you achieved around integrated care and then what could you do? And then they're going to hand back to me just to do a little boring bit around governance in terms of what the new guidance says. So I'll hand over to Joe and Faye for a moment. Thank you. Would you like me to take this first bit, Faye? Yes, please, John. <laughs> um, can we have the next slide, please, Joe? So as Sarah's just mentioned, um, we've actually been working on these things really for the last three or four years and we're well ahead of the game in Rutland. And I'm, we've just put up five aspects here and we could have put more because they exemplify, and I'm going to use this word, the culture that the services working together have developed to make these things happen because our, our excellent staff and all of our uh, organisations um, have to believe in this too and have to make it want to work and this is why it's working because they're getting behind it and we've certainly been seeing results so that nationally Rutland services are being recognised as an exemplar and certainly um, that's brought up in our reablement figures that is keeping people out of hospital and getting people out of hospital. So I'm just going to mention these uh, as stated here. So the RISE team is an, an innovative team. I'm not going to go into ma massive detail here. Uh, it stands for the Rutland Integrated Social Empowerment. But what's important about this team is it's jointly funded and run between the council and the PCN, our GP colleagues. And it's a prevention team. And I understand that now we're also going to have a member of the staff that's been jointly funded with LPT and the PCM. And it's growing and it's growing to keep Rutland people safe. And it's a very integrated team. Currently, it has a team manager um, um, that's funded by the local authority. There's a care coordinator or two in there. We've got social prescribers, link worker. There's a health coach. We've just been developing a low level mental health support, which is, of course is a growing uh, problem with the pandemic. And as we're coming out of the pandemic, we also have a care home clinical lead who's working very closely with our care homes to help keep, keep, keep people safe in them. And we now have an associated meds management pharmacist. Um, and as I say, I'm going to use this word again, this is an innovative team and it really come into its own during the pandemic and is still working hard during the pandemic because we're far from out of this thing yet. This is the team that was ringing the shielding people, um, for example, were, were talking to people who were reluctant to come forward to have vaccinations or the GPs couldn't trace. They were, they were finding out why. And we actually found people, the team found people who were, were vulnerable, who we didn't know about. And that's about, so this team's very proactive and it really shows how integration is working. It's become involved in the track and trace and is working very closely with our third sector, which is something else that the pandemic has really shown us, which I'll come to in the last part. Our integrated hospital team has a fabulous record of getting people out of hospitals rapidly and safely. Our delay figures before the pandemic were very low, some of the best in the country, which was quite a change from how it was two or three years previous to that. And this is because um, LPT and the council got together, that's the Leicestershire Partnership Trust, the managers, managers got together, the staff designed it because they designed it, it works. And in this team, we have social workers, we have uh, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, we have nurses. And during COVID, 
all through those horrible scenes of hospital uh, ITU departments and accident service departments, um, the emergency duty side, this team kept people coming out of hospital, which is a great, again, a great testament to joined up working and integrated working. You'll be aware, I'm sure, of our admiral nurses. When the admiral nurse service was put together, initially, we, we were only the second local authority in the country to do so, because we could see the, um, the advantages of having such expertise. And they, they provide the specialist dementia support that families need. During the pandemic, they work very closely to support our GPs particularly with people at end of life, because that is their expertise. Again, a good example of how integrated working occurs. Our my care is our, our carers, but it just goes, they go beyond carers. They keep people out of hospital. They keep people out of hospital when they come out of hospital and stop them going back to hospital. They prevent people going into hospital but this team is such that it will call on people who they know are vulnerable to check on for other services. And during the pandemic, these are the guys who are actually putting their own lives at risk, I'm gonna say, in going into people's homes where they were COVID positive. And the third step, I absolutely want to mention the fantastic response during the, the pandemic that we have had from our volunteers, both in the vaccination centre, um, which is nationally uh, uh, claimed and, it, and itself um, testament to integrated working, and the uh, our testing site, our shielding, getting meds and food out to people in, um, um, initially, and we need to build on that, and we're we're quite pledged now to engage better with our third sector colleagues to make sure that we do have a joined up system. Faye, I don't know if you want to take over the next one. Yes, happy to. Thank you, John. If you could move the slide on, please, Joe. So I just wanted to, to really reflect some of uh, what's already been mentioned and certainly Janet picked up as a key theme from patient feedback. So the next couple of slides really are built around those two really important issues, access and care closer to home. So just put a few figures up here really to say that elements of access are working very well in Rutland. So as you can see there, around 69% of patients are accessing same day minor illness um, services uh, in Rutland itself. 89%, as you can see there, have access to NHS community inpatient services are seen and treated at the Rutland Memorial Hospital um, and a small proportion of these at Stamford. And 100% of patients registered with Rutland Practices can now access joint um, NHS and County Council in-home services following discharge and John has already alluded to that. So the next slide please. And in terms of care closer to home, I've just um, identified here, I'm not going to read them all out, but these are some of the clinics that are provided by both the Alliance um, organisation and the L and LPT as a service. So as you can see, there's a whole range of services and clinics available um, to the Rutland population there. But we recognise that we've got more to do. So if you can move on, please, Joe. So this slide really just talks about some of the things that we want to develop and some of our ambitions. And certainly the integration delivery group is absolutely about listening to that patient voice and interpreting it and, and translating it into service delivery. So these are some of the things that we absolutely know that we need to focus on over the sort of next 12 months and beyond. So we know that we need to improve access to primary care. We've heard, obviously, we've listened to patients' voices and we understand some of the challenges uh, that have um, certainly presented as a result of the COVID pandemic and the prioritising of the vaccination programme. So we absolutely need to focus on that. And we're focusing, focusing on primary care access at an LLR perspective, as well um, as in Rutland itself. We want to develop our integrated professional community teams. Um, and John is, is given some examples already of how we've got really strong models of integration across health and social care. We want to develop this further through the sing a single therapy and nursing offer. 
So, and in terms of joint commissioning, we already use our better care funds to, uh, to put commission a lot of these services, but there'll be more focus on section 75 agreements. So how, how are we actually using pooled budgets and um, joint commissioning across health and social care to make sure that our services are integrated and seamless uh, from a patient or service user perspective. IT is a key enabler um, and we've already done some quite innovative work across care homes uh, through the pandemic and we want to really build, build on what we've learned, making sure that our IT systems all join up so we have a single view of the patient. And this really links to the, again, system work that we're doing around primary care network development. And one of the domains there around integration talks about having high functioning integrated neighbourhood teams. Well, we believe that we have the basis of that in Rutland and we really want to build on that digitally enabled um, is, is going to be a key point for us. And again, closer working relationships with wider partners, including police and fire service. So this may be something that we start to discuss in our integration delivery group. And on that point, I'll hand back to Sarah, if I may, please. Thank you, Faye. Next slide, please. So I just want to touch on one or two of the things that was in the um, guidance that came out from NHS England last week around the development of integrated care systems and the, and the next steps. And it was predominantly around designing um, what a core ICS team might do, but also what the governance arrangements might be across, um, across your system. So... Um, I want to start off by saying that the place arrangements in terms of infrastructure and governance don't change. They are really key to making this work. And the Health and Wellbeing Board um, is there at a place level. And then you've got a Rookland delivery group, I think you call it, that sit underneath that do all of the work that Faye and John have just described. And I don't see that changing, that there may be a need to think about the role and responsibilities of the Health and Wellbeing Board and how it links back into the system as we develop over the next few months. But there is no, there is no proposal at all to change the role of Health and Wellbeing Boards at a national level. They, you know, they're here to stay. They, they play their role at, at each place. And your delivery arrangements underneath that um, seem to have... Um, done you well so far and they will develop in the way that you think is best over the next few years at a system level the proposals are though that so at a very as a system as a system level effectively what is going to happen is that the three current ccgs in leicester leicestershire and rookland so for your patch that is east leicestershire and rookland ccg will cease to be in uh, exist on the 1st of april 22 they will disappear and they will be replaced by a statutory ICS organisation for LLR. And that statutory organisation will require a statutory um, governance structure, and that will be known as the LLR Integrated Care NHS Board, and it will effectively replace the CCGs. And I'll come on to just discuss a little bit more about what that does in a moment, but that sits alongside a health and care partnership at a system level, so at LLR level, that brings together local authorities and the NHS, patients and the wider voluntary sector, et cetera, to work on those wider determinants of health that I um, touched on in the earlier part of the presentation. So next slide, please. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about place infrastructure and Faye, please come in if I get any of this wrong, because I know you have discussed this um, at, with, with Rutland previously, but in terms of place governance, the Health and Wellbeing Board is there to set the vision and outcomes through your, for your health and wellbeing strategy, which I think you touched on in, in, in your um, um, matters arising. Your, um, your delivery or you, you've got a strategy straight delivery group as one will set out the wider ask and then decide, design how to, to deliver it so in real life terms it will take those things that Faye has just talked about in terms of what you want to develop further and set out how you might do that locally and in terms of the you know the ask at place level around integration integra integration of services it's about making sure people can stay well, there's, present, there's preventative services there, that we've got joined up care and treatment, 
that we've got access to digital when it when when it's the right thing to do and there's there's non digital options when they, when when that's not appropriate we can have proactive support and a lot of the things that john in particular talks about today was around proactive support and um and then through the employment and training offer um um respond to that economic and, and development and environmental sustainability part of, of what we should be doing collectively together. So can I have the next slide, please? And this is my final slide. So just at a system infrastructure level, the NHS board will take on all of the responsibilities of the CCG. So they that will become the statutory organisation. It will lead the integration across the NHS. So where there needs to be integration between NHS providers, it will lead that. It will bring those people together to plan and deliver NHS services. And it will work with the wider organisations such as local authorities to start to um, do that joint, well not start, but continue the, uh, our programme of joint working. Um, and to, and to um, impact on that population health and health and social care services. And then from a health and care partnership perspective, it's bringing the NHS and local government together as equal partners to understand the joint action where we need to take on improving health and care, influence those wider determinants of health and develop integration strategies and support place and neighbourhood. So, I think the trick or the piece of work that we need to do across LLR is to work out how the health, individual health and wellbeing boards work with both the NHS um, in the system. Um, and we've touched a lot on that. That is already working and it will continue to work. But is there anything we need to do to make it better? Yeah. But, but also, I think the challenge is how do we make the health and wellbeing boards and the health and care partnership work? work together and I think that that needs quite a bit of working through if I'm honest because health and wellbeing boards have got a job to do at place and then how does that interact with something that then looks at system I think that is an unanswered question and I think that's one of the key challenges as a as a group across LLR we need to work on um, so I hope that just gives you a flavour of what the changes are likely to be but it puts it in the context of really what's happened and wants to happen in Rutland thank you Okay, thank you, Joe. Right, thank you for that, everyone. Uh, I'm hoping there'll be some questions or comments, but if nobody minds, I'll just pop a couple of questions out myself. So, Sarah, you were talking about 80% local decision making and 20% mandated. Could you just tell me what exactly that means? So, so what that means is we will have the freedom so for example on the health and care partnership board there is only a small amount of mandation about what who your members should be and that mandation is it should be have at least one member from each local authority that delivers social care and it should have at least one member of the nhs on it yeah it should have a public voice in it um so that's the mandation and then locally, you've got the flexibility to add people onto that board, add representatives as you think fit for your local system. So I think for us, we would want a lot more than that on, on our board, on, on our care partnership board. I think we'd want representatives of the voluntary sector, from patients, from, from primary care and PCNs, from each of the, each of the unitary authorities. And from each of the providers within NHS, to be honest, rather than just one representative. So it's that sort of thing, Councillor Walters. That, that makes sense. I had another one, which was about at place level, it's easy to visualise how health and social care work together. Mm -hmm. But at the higher level, at system level, it's more difficult to see. But I think you've answered that question by saying yourself, it, it has yet to be worked out. Is, is, is that a fair I think, I, th I think the mechanics of how you work those two governance structures together definitely is working out. But for me, there will always, I think there will be some things that we can um, do collectively together that are all, that are all of our concerns and our issues across LLR. So for example, air quality is a particular issue, I think across most of us as, as one thing. I also think that 
we've worked really well actually as a system on developing a health inequalities framework. Now we, we need to implement that at place and focus each place on their own areas, but there's a certain level of things that we can do at a system level. I also, what was the other example I was gonna give around that? It's gone, um, but it will come back, I'm sure. But I think there are some things that we, that we, we can do better Oh, well, one of the things that came to health and well-being, uh, sorry, the health and care partnership board, and it's it's a small thing, but a really important thing this this month, which was last week, was we agreed to sign up to the armed forces covenant together. So individually, we'd all agreed as organisations to do that. And some of us had already done it. But as a system, we've made that commitment that we'll work together on that as well. So I think it's things like that. There are some things that we could commit to do at systems. I think the governance part about how you make that work is the bit that we need to follow through and, uh, and have discussions on, Councillor Walters. And so I'm, I'm just going to hold the floor for one more. Yeah. So, uh, this, this one's for John. Uh, you talked about RISE, My Care, and the integrated hospital team and other services that we offer together. Uh, what concerns me is that the public don't seem to appreciate what we do. Are we missing a trick here? Yes, uh, I mean, myself and Dr. Fox, we had this conversation a couple of months ago uh, and that we don't, um, <laughs> we don't tell people what we do. One of the reasons I think is because we just get on with it. And I have to say that the, uh, the pandemic has taken up an awful lot of our, our thought and time and been leaving an awful lot of tired people in their wake. And it's been changing, not changing the way that we work, but it's certainly changed our focus somewhat. But going forward, I think that we need to learn from that because, yes, I mean, uh, um, the council, for example, uh, um, our housing offer our own front desk. They, they very much work in an integrated way. And we do a great deal as a partnership, as an integrated partnership, you know, uh, to keep people safe. We do, we're very good at it in Rutland. And I agree with you totally, Councillor Walters. We don't shout about it enough and we should. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Because I know Faye introduced a whole list of services as well available locally, but I, I certainly didn't have that full list. I'm not sure most people are aware. I read somewhere, I think it was from Andy Williams, 90% of healthcare for Rutland residents is, is already provided locally, uh, but nobody seems to appreciate that. So, so Faye, do you think we can do any more? And, and if you haven't told David who you are, could you tell him now? <laughs> I do apologise, Councillor Walters. Yeah, sorry. Faye Bayliss, I'm the Deputy Director of Integration and Transformation uh, for the 3CCG. So my Executive Director is Ratch Navias, who you may have come across at some point. Um, but I absolutely agree, Councillor Walters, that we don't um, publicise what we have available for people. And maybe that is something that we should do far more publicly. So I'm very happy to get my team on really trying to map that out, what it looks like. And then we could perhaps put it on the Rutland website, you know, that we, we could do a lot more around trying to raise awareness of what's available locally for, pop for the population of Rutland. Thank you. Thank you for the people who've got your hands raised who have been very patient. So I'll start with David, if your hand is still raised. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. <clears throat> well, you certainly shout loud enough for me, John, because I know how good our uh, systems in uh, Rutland are. Um, but I have a question. Living on the eastern front of the county, um, like our dear secretary today, um, most of us are probably sitting under Stamford uh, GPs and things like that. Um, how will we get access to the same sort of forward thinking and availability of services as the rest of Rutland? <laughs> Don't know who wants to take that one. I think I, I, I'll step in here and I'm looking to colleagues um, to step in as well. I think it's really important to acknowledge that we do recognise that out of we haven't got pathways out of county quite right. Um, there needs to be far more joined up working between systems. 
particularly for population or for people who live on borders of any system. Inevitably, people will be accessing services across, and I don't think we've had that right previously. Um, it's certainly something that we've discussed in CC in our in our meetings about how do we um, really develop those out of county pathways so that it still feels um, seamless for people and and we don't disadvantage people. And I think access for any um, rural uh, county is a challenge and certainly um, Janet mentioned around transport etc so we need to where people can't access services easily within LLR we need to make sure that we're working with other systems to ensure that access uh, that people aren't disadvantaged so it, it's a work in progress is all I can say at the moment but it's something that we're absolutely cited on and determined to work on over the over the coming months. Thank you. Hey, Faye, am I right in thinking that you've added uh, representation from over county onto your delivery group, or have I just imagined that? We talked about, I don't, I don't think we've actually added people onto the delivery group. I'm just looking to, to John to see if, uh, if you've got any different information. Um, we've certainly said that we want to include an out of county chapter in the Rutland plan. Um, mm. We've still obviously not worked that up yet, but as I say, it's, it's something that we're very con conscious of yeah. and people have raised it in consultation discussions mm. previously. I think one way of influence is to get people into, into our system, isn't it, as well? So we need to think about that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, John, we, we did have an invitation accepted to come to this board, did we not? Yes, from the north, northwest Anglia, but I don't think anybody's come uh, today. But uh, yes, I mean, just to add to what Faye was uh, saying, um, um, this is something that we are very keyed, in, uh, keyed into. It's a historic problem. I mean, you know, there's many years behind this, um, from postcodes to the different ways local authorities, with the different borders of, you know, of, of, of health, right? Um, um, all sorts of things, really. Um, I think going forward, being Rutland, and we've certainly said this at the IDG, is that we're quite happy to engage with um, other ICSs, because I think this is possibly what it will take, other ICSs outside our borders, and to come up with some mutual arrangements. Now, what that looks like, I have no idea at the moment, but I think that would be a way of making it work. So otherwise, we extend our partnership, we extend our handshake at, at our place, to shake the hands of other people's places and start putting people first rather than borders. Okay, that's a hands up from David. So I think we'll move on to Hillary, if that's all right. Thank you. My question is the other side of the same coin really. Um, and, and probably John has partially answered it, but it's really a question to the CCG about whether um, they have engaged with health and wellbeing boards in Lincolnshire and Northamptonshire to ensure that all the patients that they are responsible for that are registered with our Rutland practices um, are enabled in some way to get access to the right level of integrated services. Um, so it, it's the, really the same point as David's but on, on the other side. So we've got, we've got this mismatch of areas and, and we need we need to know what the plan is to deal with that on both sides. So that's Rut Rutland residents who are registered with GPs outside Rutland, but also Rutland patients who live outside of Rutland. And I'd be really interested to know what the plan is to deal with those potential inequities. I think that's something we have to take away, isn't it, and work on, John? I don't think we can give an answer to that one. I don't know whether Faye's still here or whether she's just popped yes. off for a few minutes, but yeah. it's Sarah here. I, I, I think it's similar to what we've just talked about, but in reverse, Hilary, actually. I, I'm, I don't know whether Ratchet's team has had any direct input with, um, with the other health and wellbeing boards, but, it, but, but it's important that we do that going forward, I think. We need to have dialogue with both providers and, and other... When I say providers, I mean in the wider uh, in the wider remit of provision, not just NHS but social care provision, etc. Um, so that we make sure that we do the best for patients on either side of the coin, if you, if you, or residents on either side of the coin. It is a tricky area; it always has been, and uh, we just need to try and make it easier. I think for people. 
Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I think I think it's not just about inviting people to join our group. It's also about somebody going to to join. Yeah, I agree. And I think from Janet's, you know, these are not new patient concerns. These, no. they, but they are unresolved. No. And I think Janet. I think um, no, I think that work that Janet's been leading on will be really powerful, actually, for us to to use and take forward. So I'm looking forward to seeing that, Janet, actually. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll move on for the next question or comment to be from Janet. I would just say that we have to be a little bit careful in Rutland being so small and with our limited budget. Uh, if someone from out of county is registered with a GP in Rutland, then Rutland is not going to be able to pick up their social care at our cost. All right, so I'll just I'll just leave that one with you to ponder. And Janet, do you want to come in now with your question? Yeah, I've got some questions and observations, but picking up on on uh, Hillary's comment and um, the comment before about out of county, just wanted to give a couple of examples. Um, we actually spoke to people that live in Gretton, but are registered at, at Tuppingham Practice. Now, one, one person has a friend whose wife has dementia. He lives in Gretton. He can't access our, Admiral, our Rutland Admiral Services because he doesn't reside in Rutland. Um, that is the qualifying factor for getting support here. But he can't access Northamptonshire Admiral Nurse Services because he is registered with a GP practice. They, 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 they um, determine it differently. They do it by GP practice and we do it by place of residence. So this person has fallen through a complete black hole, really, and can't access uh, care. And it's the same with, um, again, somebody um, from just over the border, uh, needed mental health, who lives just over the border, but is registered with Epping and needed referring to mental health services. Now, it's the same chief executive of Northamptonshire Trust and Leicester Trust. Uh, but Leicestershire Partnership Trust won't take this person because they reside in Northampton and Northampton won't take him or her because they attended uh, an Uppingham GP practice. And these are pretty, you know, damning situations for the patients. So I think that's got to be, you know, that, that really needs sorting with urgency. We've referred the Admiral Nurse situation on to... Um, Health Watch Northamptonshire, and I have spoken to Angela Hillary at Leicestershire Partnership Trust about this, the mental health problem, but we haven't had a reply. My other comments are that with the list for the Alliance of the services that are provided in Rutland, a lot of the people that we spoke to weren't aware of those services and by default, they're actually being referred to um, less services out of county rather than Rutland. Could the default position be Rutland first rather than being sent out of county? Is that possible? I'll, I'll ask Hillary if she could comment on that, but I'm, sh I'm assuming it's down to clinical need, is it, Hillary, about where you refer people to? Yeah, I think a lot of the local services, although they are outpatient clinics, if there are any procedures or investigations or diagnostics required, it that requires people to travel to Leicester. Um, and we need we need to look at that, what the second line is, because um, if once that's explained to patients, they, they then choose something, they choose Peterborough because um, the outpatient clinics can only deliver part of their care and, and so that they, they will choose to go to a, to a um, an out of county. Hospital. So I think that the work that we're doing on the bringing the diagnostics to Rutland, um, hopefully, and bringing those nearer should mean that those clinics are more attractive to patients. Um, I think they are they are always offered or generally offered, um, but it's it's about what happens next after that first outpatient appointment. It's and, and that can often be the limiting factor. Thank you, Hilary. My next question is about or comment is about getting information out to um, the public and one of the things that I've really picked up that has been really appreciated 
in the county is the Rutland County Council newsletter that comes out on a weekly basis. People have really commented very favorably about that. And I'm wondering whether, I know that's only online, so it, it excludes a lot of people that you know, have, are digitally excluded, but is that something that could be developed further perhaps? Uh, you know, include health and social care. I've got a note of that, Janet. Thank you. Was, was that was that it for now, Janet? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, can I just ask um, John? So this thing about having different criteria for who is um, accepted—it's not the right word, but it's can't think of a different one. Uh, for Admiral nurses or whatever, surely that must be laid down somewhere. Different counties can't just be making their own rules up. I think it's something that comes from you mentioned UK with Admiral nurses. They, 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 they're actually governed by them. But I can't comment because I don't actually know Councillor Walters the eligibility, what the eligibility criteria is. I mean, in Rutland, it's for anybody in Rutland. It sounds to me like this again is one of those border issues. Um, mm. And the only way that we're going to overcome that is to talk to people over the border. I mean, you know, and come to a mutual arrangement. And we are quite happy to do that. In fact, we would welcome it. Okay, thank you. I know uh, Mike's been waiting patiently. Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, it's not so much a comment or a question, it's somewhere between two. I just want to go back to sort of the original starting point of the meeting with John's timeline on the strategy, because part of me thinks the conversation we've just had around the border issues, eligibility differences is something that we need to pick up in the strategy, because what will set us apart in Rutland from, say, Leicester City is the sense that a place-based board and a place-based plan needs to be looking as much to the eastern to the southeast as it is to kind of towards LLR. So that's self-evident, probably worthwhile making a point on. And then the other one relates to that, which again, isn't for me about membership, but equally I'm thinking we've never really had much chance within the health and wellbeing board to talk about things like housing growth and um, you know uh, economic growth within Rutland and putting that at the heart of place. So for me, I don't think that's about inviting extra people, but again, through me and John and Emma Jane as well, in, in terms of council colleagues, we do need to make certain that we've got a feed in, in terms of we understand what Rutland is going to look like in the next 10, 20, 30 years, and then base our plan around that. Otherwise, I fear we'll come back to the usual touch points, which is our existing service provision and the existing sort of fractures in service provision, and we miss the sense of where we're going um, as Rutland. Yeah. Very wise. Sarah? Yeah, I, thank you. I'd just like to come in on that point as well, because we are starting to do some work jointly with your with your um, planning teams, etc., on what Rutland may look like in the future or what demand that might then have as a, as a consequence of that on health. And I would, I like, Mike would like to join those two things up actually and have it in one plan if I'm honest, because I, I think, you know, housing growth is as important to the health and wellbeing strategy as it is to what, how we organise primary care or other NHS services, because it all has impact, doesn't it, in terms of what the population is likely to look like in a few years' time. So, uh, yeah, I'd welcome that as well, that we could join those things up together. Thanks. I'm not sure if, Faye, did you want to come in on this one, or is that a legacy message you sent me? <laughs> It was a kind of general, so if now's convenient, that would be great, thank you. So apologies to everybody. I've got a hand function on Zoom, I don't know why, so apologies. Um, but I just wanted really to, um, I suppose, speak, uh, address this to Janet. I think this, it would be really helpful for us to have a conversation about, particularly around some of those out of county issues, because I think rather than trying to sort of boil the ocean, it'd be really helpful if we could identify a few of those specific services that people are trying to, you know, where is the, where is it? most of people's um, dissatisfaction coming from? Is it a particular service that, that people are trying to access and find it difficult or is it more general than that? And I think we could probably have a sort of a targeted discussion about this at one of our integration delivery groups, John. I don't know if, if you agree that that would be a helpful thing to do. And I, and I think also in response to the Alliance query as well, 
it would be really good to understand a little bit more how, how referrals happen to and from Alliance. Um, so it'd be great to invite uh, one of my colleagues to that, uh, to a discussion in the future. And we can really, really sort of start to get to get underneath some of that as well. So I think what we could, what we need to do is start to have a bit of a forward plan on some of the agenda items that we bring to the integration delivery group to make sure that we really are addressing the, um, the feedback that you're getting from the public. That sounds like a plan. Janet, have you got a legacy hand there? Oh, sorry. Yes, I have. But just I'll take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. Say to Faye that, yes, I'd be quite happy to um, have a conversation with her. That's great. I, I don't see any more hands. And looking at the clock, I think we should possibly move on. Uh, but thank you for the presentation and the useful discussion afterwards. Am I right in thinking we're moving on to Emma J now that Seven has actually been incorporated? So it's over to you, Emma Jane. Thank you very much. I will try and share my screen. And if I fail, <laughs> I'll ask Joe to do it for me. Uh, let me just see. Is that sharing? Has that shared? Yep. Yes, it is. Okay. And is it sharing as the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I wanted to do is just to um, present to you a way of thinking about um, how we might look at um, what the plan um, might look like going forward. And when we're saying that we're going to offer something to our local population, what is it that we need to think about when we're looking at the proactive and preventative focus um, responsive to the needs of our local population? First of all, we need to have a think about what is it we're talking about? Who is this population and what does this mean for our population? So I've put together a, um, a short presentation that just leads us thinking about how we could work actually inside out, how we support somebody's um, independence. So I started thinking about if we had somebody at the center of our thinking, actually we want to start them off thinking about their own self-management, um, that it isn't just about us doing things to people or for people, but how we actually encourage some of the center of their world to be actually part of their own self-management. Obviously wrapped around that are a lot of informal networks, family, friends, voluntary sector. And on the next ring out, there's going to be some um, integrated community health, social care. Um, we've, John's already highlighted five um, really, really important parts in terms of our community services, Admiral Nurses, Integrated Hospital Team, RISE, PCN, um, the primary care network, our GPs. And looking at the very outer layer of somebody's life, we're looking at the formal networks um, of hospitals, acute settings. Um, and I think what I want to reinforce is that health and well-being is actually made at home. And I would suggest that hospitals are for repairs, but everybody has a home, whether it's a care home or their own home in the community to go back to. So working my way outside, working back in, um, if we're looking at the formal and um, statutory services, we're looking at the primary care, secondary acute care, and looking at social care sitting out in the very widest um, sense of that assessment of when somebody becomes eligibility um, for services. But we need to make sure that when we're thinking about um, putting together a plan that the emotional and social needs are just as important as some of the physical needs and um, so we must mustn't fall into the trap of looking at somebody's medicalized um, status rather than their emotional side as well and we, we realize that if somebody's sitting in the outer ring and they're um, involved very much in a hospital situation, they've got little choice about when something happens within their day um, because somebody's already planned what time that appointment might be. Um, and we need to make sure that um, we're not actually getting people to um, almost be disabled by the um, sort of 
how, how do I put it, that, that people are telling them what they should do. So people are saying to them, you've got to stay in because I'm coming to give you a shower um, or you've got to stay in because I'm coming to change your dressing. Um, and people's control of their own lives becomes quite limited then. And what we're trying to do, and, and certainly with some of our community services, we try to deliver a care plan as a framework rather than prescriptive tasks. Obviously, what we want to do, um, thinking about the next layer in when we're looking at the um, community, we're looking at stopping people going into our acute settings or bringing them back um, to their communities, is thinking about the strength-based approach. So focusing on the person themselves, empowering that person to seek the access to those informal and community support networks, um, to look at um, the support and care being based on opportunities, on outcomes, and not on time and tasks. I'm not coming at eight o'clock to give you your shower, but actually, if you feel that you are able to do um, some of the personal care tasks, what else can we support you with to um, encourage you to become independent again? Making sure that it's integrated. Um, I know Healthwatch will say the same thing that people are saying, I only want to say my story once. I don't want to keep telling everybody. I don't want lots of um, professionals coming into, into my home at various times during the day. And particularly during the pandemic, we, we recognise that you know, there are other ways of, of delivering support to people that is very much integrated, working alongside the voluntary and community um, sector. And this is about stepping up and stepping down. It's not just about somebody's going into hospital and they're coming back to their community. What can we do way, way, way before they go into hospital in the first place to support them perhaps to avoid actually a hospital admission? So we're talking about both of it. So we're talking about the community. There is um, very much a, an inter sort of connection between somebody's um, meaning and purpose, their mental um, well-being alongside their physical and social well, well-being. And um, for an individual, I'm sure yourselves will, will, will resonate with this, it's really important that you're feeling that you are part of a community, that you are achieving well-being and that you've got a sense of worth in life. And I think I've, I saw this slide um, not so long ago and I thought this probably sums up what I'm trying to say. People live in healthy households, looking after themselves with their family and friends. Yes, they have practical care and support to support them to do that. Um, but there are things called healthy neighbourhoods where the community wraps themselves around these healthy um, healthy households they're part of a community they've got leisure centers they've got something to do they're talking with each other they, they've got that connection there are obviously times when um, they will need support but may, making that support as part of one team and that's what we're talking about when we're saying about integrated health and social care and community and some of the ones that are listed on this slide here is talking about um, community nursing, managing long-term um, conditions, mental health, therapy, pharmacy, um, so wrapping that round as one team that's working in an integrated way and obviously hospital care comes part of the specialist care and um, that sits on the outside of that so it's about managing people's um, independence giving them hope that they can actually live in their own beds at home what matters to them what support do I need to return and stay at home for as long as possible and that is about trust as well, trusting that people will um, be enabled to take the responsibility for their own lives to do things that they want. So to sum up, what I'm trying to say is if somebody's in the centre of their world, we will support them through their informal networks um, and self-management. And when they get into that um, sort of second from the outside ring that we've got an integrated community health and social care working with the voluntary sector to stop them going into the outer ring or if they are going into the outer ring making sure that they go in there for as short a period of time as possible and that we are encouraging them through the services that we're integrating in the community to come back into their informal networks and ultimately back home. So I just thought I'd do this presentation just to start us to think and give you some thoughts and ideas as to what the offer to the local population is and what do we actually mean by proactive preventative focus that actually puts the person at the centre of this. Thank you.
Oh, I don't know how to stop sharing now. Hang on a second. I've lost my mouse as well. <laughs> okay. Oh. Should be a button at the top of your screen. Hang on a second. Oh, show. Red button. No, no red button, red Joe. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, if I get rid of this off my screen, then it will probably, there we go. Does that help? Yes. The, the irony of not being able to get a supporting independent slide off your screen because of not knowing the button. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> ah. uh, so, that's, that's fine. Thanks, Emma Jane. Um, would someone like to come in with any comments or questions on that one? Oh, David. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> now, that, that all sounds very, uh, very practical and very useful and something that uh, we should all be able to do. But I guess the thing that worries me slightly um, from the peripheral of the uh, medical services is if we go back maybe to when I was a little chap, which is a long time ago, um, within your village or within your community, there was a, a much stronger bond uh, between people in terms of the local GP used to come out and see aged parents or things like that. You used to have a street where everybody knew everybody. And um, I just wonder, um, to make the system work as well as it should be able to work that you've outlined, you need some sort of glue or focal point that is actually picking all those bits up and keeping the continuity going. And I just wondered whether currently our uh, communities are um, public minded enough to be able to do that. Absolutely. And I think that's that's the focus that we need to have. If we can um, do that, if we can have our communities working as a strength based approach and the things that are good in the communities that actually people are able to access and support, then it prevents that um, longer term or crisis response um, and, and more expensive health and social care services coming in. So absolutely, that is is the focus that we need we, we need to do. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, I, I, I feel in some ways we've got a unique window of opportunity in terms of engaging with our people at the moment. I think the pandemic was was a real opportunity for people to stop and think and, and notice actually the people that they lived around and lived lived close to. But I also think we need to move away from our historical communication with people, which is around, you know, we, you know we're stretched, our public public sector um, services are stretched and therefore we need you to be to look out for each other and, a, and actually the narrative needs to be we need you to look out for each other because it's the right thing to do because being neighbourly is the right thing to do and because as a group of people you actually have a huge amount to contribute and we want to work with you and we want to help you to make that contribution so, so for me I think there is something thinking about place and thinking about neighbourhood around how we prioritise that conversation, but also how we change the tone of that conversation. Because people don't want to do something because the government can't afford for them to access the services that it is paying for through its taxes. People want to do that because actually they're neighbourly and they're good people and they want to be a part of their community. And I think that we haven't communicated with people well around these kinds of issues and the asset-based community issues over the years. And I think that's a real area for, for focus for health and wellbeing boards. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to bring in mine, uh, Mike, but Janet, could you just ponder for a second? Um, I got told off the other day for saying there was no real sense of community in Rutland as a whole, and it was broken down into little segments. I wouldn't, can I ask you to ponder on that and come back to me when we've heard from Mike? See whether you agree from your feedback. But anyway, Mike. 
Yeah, um, I guess the thought in my mind is we talk about the success of Rise. And I know that's got a slightly different ethos and a slightly different focus, but I'm almost thinking that to some extent, whether we could extend it, would be the glue that that sort of does that does that thing that, that Rachel's been talking about. So probably look to John from your perspective and then feeding into Emma Jane, just in terms of there's something there we could build on to help provide it. Let's call it the oil in the inner wheels or the oil in the gears more than the glue. That sounds better. Yeah, um, it's <laughs> strength of asset, asset based approaches is, is the bread and butter in social services. And I absolutely take uh, David's point. If we go back into that, I'm going to be very kind, David, into the 60s and 70s. You know, um, things were uh, um, a bit different then. Um, however, <sighs> Rachel, I think um, you've got a real key to this, which, which goes back to how good we do things earlier. We don't communicate this. And I think you're right that it needs to be badged. We need to do this because it's it's the right thing to do, because it's the nice thing to do. We can then start to look at the, the overall well-being of the people. You need to do this to keep yourselves fit. You're independent, you know, less reliant. You're happier. You start to then get um, into this circle. And your point also of a window of opportunity because there is a sense of community at the moment. We look at how all those volunteers came out of the woodwork um, at the start. There is something out there. You can feel it. You walk down the streets, you could feel it. So there is a window of opportunity, but what's the glue? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, something like the RISE team, something like the My Care team, if we were to really start to expand that. And we mentioned earlier about police and fire. There's other services out there. There's PCSOs. There's, there's all types of people who can start working together. Eyes and ears, all with the same voice, looking out for the vulnerable, talking to the vulnerable, promoting what people could be doing um, for the well-being. I think there's a lot that we can do, but I think the communication actually is going to be the key thing from um, where I'm sitting. Uh, so it's very naughty of me to drop Janet in it, isn't it? Uh, I probably won't be very popular. Uh, but I got the sense during the worst of COVID, there was tremendous numbers of people coming forward to volunteer. Uh, I didn't get a sense it was a cross Rutland. So you had each village would have its own help and Oakham had its own help and Uppingham had its own help. We don't have anyone here that I know of from the voluntary sector. Correct me if I'm wrong, just scream at me. So Janet, you're the nearest I've got, so sorry. Have I misread this completely or, or do we need to do some work before Rutland actually feels like a community? We all say we love it and there's something special about Rutland and then everybody fights for their own corner. And you're on mute. Sorry, I'm trying desperately to think back to a course I did on what is community and it's just... All right, OK. <laughs> um, I think Rutland, Rutland people are fiercely protective of their identity as belonging to Rutland. And I think that is the starting point for anything. I think you're right that um, community, community became very important during the lockdowns, particularly, I think, the first lockdown. And I'm, I'm sort of turning my mind back to um, VJ Day. And I live in a close of 19 dwellings and we all sat on our front gardens with a bottle of wine. And then we all sort of circulated at the regulatory two meters. And everybody said how fantastic this was. We really must do it again. And we really must um, uh, do it when the, the lockdown was over. And you know what, we've not. We've all retreated back into our houses. We say hello if we sit past each other in the street, but that absolute bond that we had on that day has dissipated. But going on to uh, John's comment, he's talking about the police and the fire. I've never seen, well, since we had our own business selling petrol, I have never seen a fireman or fire engine in the village I live in. 
We never see a policeman. But what I do see and who stops and chats with me and others on a regular basis is the local postman. So perhaps the postman is the, the, the link between the communities more so than police and fire that we tend to call on in an emergency only. Um, so that was, I had another point to make. Oh, um, yes, from the engagement that we've been doing, it was put to me, not strongly, but by two or three people who said that they felt that villages have a stronger sense of community than the towns. They feel that in the towns that, that it isn't there. Whereas, you know, I have a fairly sort of fixed idea of where I am in my community, in my village. My community, my, my presence in Rutland is a lot more blurred and wavery as such. It's, you know, you know I'm proud of being a Rutlander. I'm proud that I grew up and went to school in Rutland, um, but that's gone. I'm here now. And, you know, it's getting that, that old, that connection back somehow that I think is so very important if we can do it. Does that answer your question? <laughs> It does, and I don't feel too bad about it now. So Emma Jane, I think it's a fantastic way forward, but I, I do think there's work to be done to actually make it come across in practice. I'm just looking for any more hands. Oh, Rachel, sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, sorry, just coming back in. I'm, um, I'm just kind of giving a nod to Faye, really, about a piece of work that we, we did around organisations working more closely together across health and care. And, and a growing tagline that has emerged through that work around more good days. So we just talk about more good days. We don't talk about health. We don't talk about social care. We don't talk about staff separately from patients, but we talk about what is common to all of us in terms of what makes more good days. And it's not about perfection, but it's around a journey that we're on so that actually everybody has more good days. And I think that that would be really translatable into community work, because actually for some residents, more good days will be will mean more connectivity with their with their neighbours. And it's not all around kind of statutory services. It's not even all around voluntary services, but but asking a question about what more good days means and then separating that into the sphere of control of what people could do for themselves what statutory organisations might need to focus on, but also what neighbourhoods and neighbours might need to think about a little bit more of and, and what they can do. And I think you're right, Janet. You know, I think postmen, I think the local pubs, I think the, the go-to shops that people, that people kind of frequent, that they go into sort of more regularly than others are, are kind of natural people places. And I think the risk when we start talking about integrated care systems and places and neighbourhoods in this context is that we forget that they're not necessarily the neighbourhoods that our people would recognise. You know, so mums will recognise schools as their neighbourhood. That's where they will catch up on the gossip. That's where they will find out what's going on when they're dropping off and picking up, you know, and different people will have different environments. And I think thinking about kind of what more good days means in those kind of circles will help us get a much more rounded view of how we can work with people. And actually, for some people, it will mean keeping myself to myself because I work full time. I'm really busy and I don't spend a lot of time in, you know, in town or with my neighbours but but for others it'll mean something different I like the way you've summed that up Rachel and no one else has their hand raised so I think we're going to take that as the concluding comment if that's all right with everybody I, I like it um, so we're moving on to item nine the better care fund so I see Sandra's arrived uh, David, do you know what the Better Care Fund is? So if, if Sandra just said Better Care Fund, Section 75, would you have a clue? I'm not being rude. I know it features. You know it features. <laughs> okay, over to you then, Sandra. That would be good. This is probably a less inspiring and engaging conversation than the ones you've had so far today. 
uh, is a little bit more around the mechanics of, of life. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief for you, but try and find a couple of, a couple of sparklers in there. So um, there are three items in the Better Care Fund update this time. Obviously, we've been in strange times, navigating strange seas, and um, the Better Care Fund process this year sort of reflects that. So I've brought you three things. The first one I'll highlight is the Section 75 agreement. And I'm sorry, you ended up with sort of a, a half a brick of, 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 of weight of Section 75 in your, in your packs this time. Um, the Section 75 has been updated um, and refreshed to cover both last year and the coming, the coming year, which is already underway. That agreement basically forms the, the rule set, if you like, for the CCG and the local authority to collaborate around, around pooled funds. So uh, most of the update has been really um, around the naming of committees, the naming of roles and individuals who are closely involved in the process, um, and some, some financial update in terms of, of updating numbers. There hasn't been a really, a really substantive update, but it's our duty to bring you that agreement as part of the process of signing that off, hence, hence its inclusion. And you, there may be things where you want to ask questions, in which case, obviously, absolutely open to that. So that's the first thing out of the way. The second thing, we have brought you um, some of the, the highlights from um, the year-end report for last year for the BCF. Now, in an ordinary year, you would have, you would have heard more regularly at, in more detail about the programme, which is obviously our, our, our primary um, tangible um, program of, of collaboration and integration across health and health and care and the voluntary sector. So last year we didn't have a program approval a process nationally for obvious reasons. Um, so in fact the year-end report is covering is covering the um, just confirming to national the shape of the program we pursued and then um, some reflection if you like on how how the year went. As a, as a classic year-end exercise. No targets were set for last year because of our strange circumstances, so um, you won't see any reporting on performance, but um, in fact I would say given the circumstances we didn't have a terrible year. Um, a lot of the programme is either roles or contracts which carried on being delivered insofar as possible. We did hit a few um, bumps in the road, as you can imagine. So for example, um, it, was it was possible to allocate the funds for the Disabled Facilities Grant, but it was very challenging to spend them with considering the safety of individuals in their homes and not wanting construction to take place with the various um, lockdown rules, meaning that construction couldn't take place. And then also with difficulties in the supply of materials. For building so stair lifts went in went in fairly routinely but anything which was a bathroom or similar really we've had a great deal of difficulty and those projects are stacked back to be delivered as and when that becomes possible in a bit of a catch-up situation this year we had um, another project which was which was temporarily um, postponed was a referral system for social prescribing which will give us a real uh, facilitation in terms of how we work how we work on social prescribing and with, with across across multiple agencies um, in that in that endeavour, um, and then also we did see areas where um, the pandemic actually gave us opportunities to develop in terms of the services that we were offering. So, uh, the I'll, I'll highlight two examples. One is Rise, which I, I, I gather probably has already been discussed quite a lot today, but. In essence, RISE, RISE wasn't a team in January of 2020. It formed very quickly as a team. And then as, as the pandemic hit, that team's work in social prescribing and more enriched and broadened to also support the pandemic efforts. And from that, we've learned an enormous amount. Um, and that team has evolved and really strengthened um, considerably over the course of the year, which is feeding into um, our, our current year's programme, which I'll, I'll come to in a second. The other thing where we had uh, quite strong development was in terms of supporting care homes. And obviously, 
that's a sector that had a very bad time indeed last year and we were able to put in place a role um, which supported the care homes formed a relationship with them saw them through thick and thin effectively you know providing a, a brilliant conduit for all the news and the the, the, the the new requirements that they had to take on board but also holding their hand holding their hand through through um th through a very difficult year and building up the the trust and the and the joint working which is now putting us in a, in a good position around um enhanced health and care homes of course so so a bit of a mixed year one way or another but a, a, a much better year than it than it could have been in the circumstances so so the the year end report closes closes the year um and then for the current year it won't surprise i mean in a good year the um the policy guidance is delayed on a routine basis for the better care fund and we're sort of used to that now and we carry on delivering on the basis of the of the consensus that we have uh, between the local authority and the ccg of course and then with the wider partnerships as, as expressed through through the the health and wellbeing board so um what we've presented to you in the absence of the national guidance which is apparently coming in the next few few weeks we hear is um a bit of a, a working budget if you like for for the current year and um we are in a bit of a transitional situation with with better care fund we thought that last year would be the last um isolated year program and we were moving towards something which was multi-annual, but obviously right now we're not in a position to be in that happy place. So this year will be another bridging year. It's expected that when the guidance comes through, it will be pretty much saying carry on with, you know, it's, this, it's the same rules as previously, but we're expecting maybe some changes in terms of the, um, the metrics and indicators that we need to apply to the programme but not major change because this is going to be a final stopgap year before there's reform in what happens with these budgets and how they're organized and, 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 and passed pass down to us. So the program remains, we've kept as much continuity as possible. It remains in its four priority structure of prevention, complex care, hospital step up, step down, and then the enablers, and we've just really reorganized where it feels that that's that's the right thing to do on the basis of how things are evolving. So, for example, RISE is now sort of formed more visibly in that program as a as a as a um, as a unit and an important part of our prevention um, response and the care home role, which I highlighted previously, is now a kind of bread and butter part of the um, of the complex care um dimension of our program you'll you'll spot a few other changes in there in terms of how things are organized but there's nothing sort of um very very fundamental we've also there's been a decision from the ccg around um the flow of some budget towards um therapy where obviously with rising levels of hip fractures and so on and the the impact of the lockdown um false prevention is particularly important to us at the moment we've had some challenges with recruiting to the therapy roles in the program so um that funding is now going to flow directly to the local authority to form um a stronger team to to, to respond to that issue rather than um be, being rooted rooted via by LPT, but this is with the agreement of all three parties just to, to, to try to get over some of the some of the challenges that are being faced in that area. So, so fundamentally, it's a story of continuity. We have we have a good record of effective working, effective joint working, and, and, and clear consensus around, around the direction of travel. So um, I would invite your um, feedback and comments. Um, but I think that then the next time that we We'll be back to you i imagine is is once we actually do have the the national guidance and we can we can we can finalize fully what's in the program to be submitted nationally thank you sandra this is something that those of us on the council who are aware of it are extremely proud of and you should be proud of the service as well so thank you 
but again, I'm not sure many people in the community have a clue as to what we do. I just leave that point hanging there and I think Hillary wants to come in. Thank you. Um, yeah, tremendous. Um, I've got two things really which are, are separate and I'm not sure whether they fit under public health or under the um, BCF. One is about a priority for weight management which um, has been recently introduced as a, a clinical priority and I wonder what the provision for that was in the BCF. Um, and with the public health and section 75 and also talking about section 75 and referring to our earlier conversation how is that working with um, people on the periphery for us so this is a question really to the CCG again how is that work and working for people who don't live in Rutland and what negotiations have you had with the other counties in order to make sure that the BCF provision for those patients um, it means that they're getting an equitable service, for example, in the, the treatment of menorrhagia and the IUD fittings under the Section 75 agreement. So it, it's a little bit about the cross border. And also, if, if you could just ask a question about weight management services and how we're going to enhance and enhance those for the county as a clinical priority. So if I respond to a part of that, so with yes. We, we understand that there's a, a new provision uh, coming through public health, which isn't part of the uh, Better Care Fund budget, but we'd be working actively with that in the same way that the, the, Beth, you know, the Better Care Fund is, is a whole series of roles who also work fairly seamlessly with, with tapping into other provision, um, which is which is available across the patch. So there has been an increase in, in the emphasis on that. Plus, of course, um, the community wellbeing service, RISE and so on are very um, proactive in terms of promoting physical activity, healthy lifestyles, healthy conversations, and so on. So 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 those um, those factors are already sort of woven through if not explicit explicitly set out um, as a as a sort of itemized list of, of, of factors that that are, that are being followed up um, in terms of the section 75 there's a conversation progressing at the moment isn't there a piece of a piece of work looking at what are the populations um, who may be in scope for different actions, depending on who's funding those actions, and I think that's that's a that's a conversation which um, which is which is continuing and which which does need a resolution. Can I just bring Mike in because I think you might have something on this, how you might? Yeah, just just the wage management bit. I was trying to uh, remember the detail, but I mean Sandra's right. So there's two ways of looking at this. Certainly, in terms of tier two weight management, the interim is. Rutland spot purchasing from Leicester County Council public health as a service provider. So at least we've got some mm -hmm. tier two in. Tier three, I think there's some interim provision in, but again, not through much so BCF, but um, across the system, but focused on place. There's always been, as you know, for some years, the need to have proper tier three um, capacity in place, which we've just not mm -hmm. had, certainly not within Rutland and not within in, um, in Leicestershire. So there's probably two bits. Weight management generally is getting more emphasis, as Sandra says. I think we've probably still got a little bit of a way to go to really bottom out what's needed at tier three. Thanks. Are you okay with that at the moment, Hilary, so I can bring Dave to you? May I just come back on that? So as a PCM, yeah. we've been tasked with referring more patients to weight management services. Um, and, and I don't think that's going to include the sort of the, the general um, promoting activity and so forth. I think that's specific weight management services. Um, so we need to be able to have those services in place. And in yep. the GSNA, um, rising obesity rates is one of the health concerns for Rutland. Um, so I wonder if this is an opportunity for the Health and Wellbeing Board to develop um, an obesity and weight weight management strategy that covers all of our patients and is integrated into Active Rutland and the RISE team and all the other all the other building blocks that we've got because we could be really effective you know we could be a bit of a flagship in managing 
um, how this is done. But I think at the moment we don't have, we have this, this need as a PCN to have weight management services to refer into, um, but we don't really have the, the detail and, the, and the, the strength of those services locally, because I think where they are commissioned um, through Leicester County Council, they're not very local. Um, so I think we do have a, a, a need to look at what we can do better in that particular um, format for a number of reasons, and, and not least because it's a JSNA priority. It's a point well made, Hilary, and I remember you making it a year ago or so. So yes, that's noted, and I see John nodding. Uh, can I just bring David in? Well, nothing to say except just to make the obvious observation that that was a, a very clear and perfectly tailored brief. Thank you very much indeed, Sandra. And any help on weight management, unlike the chairman that we have, I'm always on receive. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, Janet, you wanted to come in? Yes, thank you. Um, I really want to endorse and back what um, Hillary said, because as somebody that's fighting the petrol battle with weight, I think it's very essential to, to um, have some sort of clearer guidance towards weight management services and opportunities. Um, my only concern is that I, am, I have been hearing from some people that any exercises, classes, etc., uh, there are problems. The first is that uh, it's very difficult to access these services if you don't have your own private transport because the um, buses just don't run when they, they need to. And the second one is the cost. And it has been said that the cost of exercise, etc., is much more expensive in Rutland than in, say, Milton Mowbray. So I think those are two considerations that need to be born in mind. But yes, I really agree with Hilary on that one. Thanks. Did you want to come in again, Mike? Yes, yeah, so I've just um, asked my team what we've got around weight management services in Rutland, because there is provision. I get Hilary's point about it's not being local. Um, let's raise money, because this is where the BCF and the integration piece comes in. Um, to be blunt, there's no point telling me that I need to provide more weight management services when the public health budget is stretched to high heaven. So. If that's a priority, this is where we do need that multi-agency partnership conversation about we can stand up the provision. And I like the idea of shaping it around a Rutland whole system of obesity and weight management service. But this, you know, I mean, it's that one, isn't it? We can't just look at a budget and go, oh, can you do a bit more on that? This is the bit where we need to put our collective shoulders to the wheel and see what we can do across the budgets. If we can do that, then we'll be laughing. That's right. David's back, I think. I just state the obvious and uh, revert back to uh, Emma's uh, earlier thing about helping ourselves. You can't put a television on at the moment without seeing someone giving you all sorts of exercises and things like that aimed at every possible person, whether they can stand up, sit down or run round. So um, there is quite a lot of self-help stuff out in the, available on the media. Yeah, Sandra, you wanted to come in. I can't actually see you, Sandra. So if you did want to come in, or if you oh, want I'm to, oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I was obviously <laughs> muted. That's all right. I, I was just saying. I, I just wanted to agree, really, with that point around there are lots of opportunities that don't necessarily cost um but obviously you need a core of guidance and support but when you think about things like um park run park walk um power parks which is um online exercise the quality of the natural environment that we've got here but we need to obviously make make the most of that thank you yeah and that, your comments tie in with the feedback we're getting from our leisure review, uh, where the natural environment is classed as being so important and such an opportunity. But uh, Mike, are you coming in again before I go back to Hillary? 
Yeah, just to make the point, I mean, yes, again, totally accept we need to make the most of the natural environment. There's a difference, though, between the specific weight management um, services for uh, patients who are overweight and obese and referred by GPs, which is where Hilly referred to, as opposed to the tier, tier one general education promotional advice. So, again, that whole system strategy around overweight and obesity within Rutland would encompass all those tiers. But I'd recognise we do this through Active Rutland. We've got some provision here in the middle bit. And then at the top end of this, we haven't got anything, or at least we haven't got very much. So um, I wouldn't want to, I don't want to sort of denigrate or play down the bits we have got in place. We just need to make certain we've got everything we need at the three tiers. Otherwise, Hillary's in a position of um, referring a big patients to go for a park run, which isn't going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes perfect sense. Hillary, do you want to finish this one off? Yeah, just really um, a plea for a strategy, you know, a Rutland strategy. We've got lots of the building blocks in place. We've got a health and wellbeing coach who works between, you know, works for, for the PCN and with the RISE team. We've got the RISE team. We've got lots of people who are interacting with lots of people. Then it's a question of making every contact count. And I think if we, if we built on Emma Jane's model um, with, with the informal network self-care moving on to it, which is, which is really the same, the tier one, tier two, tier three, isn't it? Um, but using this as an example of how that could be achieved. Um, yes, we need some things to refer into, but actually for the vast majority, what we need is to use what we've got um, slightly differently rather than um, necessarily invest large amounts of money in um, you know, the, the, the more complex weight management. Okay. I think we take the point away. So John and Faye, do we look at this as a separate item or should it actually form part of the plan for Rutland? How do you see it? Personally, I think it should form part of the grand plan. Uh, and I think it's something, um, Faye, if you agree that we could raise in the IDG uh, because all partners are there uh, uh, around the table. And we certainly um, in the council have quite a lot that we can bring to this, I think. And with our enhanced public health offer that we've, we've been talking about, um, Mike, we've got a little bit more capacity there and therefore a little bit of expertise that will feed into the IDG. And I think that we can possibly and should be able to come up with something, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, John, if I can come in on that, it'd be worthwhile copying in Viv because I was just going to drop her a note to hear who's providing the current tier two management and obviously people in my team. So um, if you just want to reach out from the IDG and then we could, I could just wrap the right people around that. Thank you for that. I thought I'd come up with that idea and then saw it in the chat room. But never mind. Eh? Uh, is there anything else on uh, the presentation that Sandra made in general? And if not, can we just say, yes, we've, we've, we've noted what Sandra has to say and that we're sort of moving along with that plan as it is. Are we content generally? Yeah. I don't see any. I'll just click my participants button just to double check because I can't see you all. No, you're on. Yeah. Oh, Hilary, are you up again? Or is that legacy? Sorry, I'm up again, just referring you to part of my original question, which is about the BCF from the other counties um, and how we are accessing these sorts of services from other counties, whether the CCG can answer that. I think it relates to the previous conversations that we've had, uh, Hilary. Uh, we haven't yet, but it's absolutely something that we need to start thinking about how we do um, really do that integration with other systems to make sure that people aren't disadvantaged. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that, that's all the formal proceedings over with. Uh, I've not been notified of any other urgent business. All I am left with is the date of the next meeting, which is the 5th of October, at which, among other things, we hope to bring you something about our proposed plan for health for Rutland. Uh, we should also have there the priorities and principles of the ICS at system level for us to agree or otherwise. Okay, thank you everyone and we'll see you then. Well, I'll see most of you before then. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Yep, thanks all.